So whatever you think of Uprising, and most people seem to think it's pretty terrible, <laughs> but even if you loved it, you have to admit that it probably killed the franchise. <laughs> at least any chance of getting anything in live action. Personally, I can switch my brain off and enjoy it for what it is, but there is no denying that this should have been better. But in this video, I'm gonna talk about what could have been, because at one stage, Guillermo del Toro did have plans for a sequel of his own, which would have been called Pacific Rim Maelstrom. This is a Maelstrom, by the way, just in case you don't know. It's kind of like the C's inverted nipple. This is an inverted nipple, by the way, just in case you don't know. Do you really need me to explain? So I'm gonna look at what that might have looked like and why it didn't happen. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the man himself because he has an anthology series coming out around Halloween, which I'm quite looking forward to. As usual though, you know where the like button is, and please subscribe because I'm going to keep you updated with any news on the Pacific Rim franchise, if something does bud. Right now, it's kind of tumbleweeds, but you know, we live in hope, right? Just on a personal note, I'm not expecting this video to be hugely popular. Like with all things on this channel, it's something that I do for myself, and if any particular vid doesn't do that well, like it really doesn't bother me, and it just makes me extra appreciative to those that did watch it. So, cheers guys. But let's start with the man himself. And here I'm talking more about his directing work than his writing or producing, but to me, GDT's work is kind of a mixed bag. Like, and I'm gonna put my hands up right now and say, I didn't care for Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> no. I really didn't. Uh, like, it's one of those ones that I can see that it has all the right ingredients for a good movie right here, but none of it particularly resonated with me. Like Mad Men, for example. You know, that's another good example of what I'm saying. I can see that it's probably genius, but but I just don't get it. I think the first GDT movie that I would have seen would have been Blade 2, a movie that was actually pretty boss in a lot of ways, but yeah, with a couple of large problems. But building on what he'd done in 1997's Mimic, it quickly positioned him as the action slash horror slash fantasy slash, no, 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 that's it, I think. A guy who could get every penny of his budget up on that screen to give us something that looked lavish and detailed and stylized and creating this visual that evoked like a dreamlike quality in how immersive that it was. So then he put all that to task with Hellboy and the rest is history. Oh yeah, and also, you know, I'm not really touching on his Spanish language films like Devil's Backbone because I feel like they're almost in a completely different category and one that's not particularly relevant to anything I'm saying here. Aww. Now, when it comes to Pacific Rim, which I've spoken about a whole lot on my channel already, got a whole review just on that movie that I'm gonna link up somewhere if I remember. Uh, but in that movie, he made this love letter to the kaiju and to the mecha genre, which was not based on any existing property. Not a video game, not a book, not a graphic novel. And I know it takes big inspiration from lots of different things, but you've got to understand how much studios hate taking this kind of risk. If they're gambling 100 million, they usually want to know there's a pre-existing audience and market that they can tap into. So this movie gets massive credit for just being something original. The problem is though, the Pacific Rim did okay at the box office, but didn't exactly set the world alight. I'm pretty sure that over time it made pots of money, like a lot of movies do, but it's really that initial like opening weekend figures and the, the initial release figures that matter to these guys. And all this made everyone pretty shaky when it came to putting their cash on the table again for the sequel. On top of that, Legendary was acquired by a Chinese corporation called Wanda and formed a new relationship with Universal as opposed to Warner Brothers. And there generally seems to be a lot of upheaval around this time and pretty soon GDT said, I'm out. Oh, bruh. But while promoting Nightmare Alley, has anyone seen that? I haven't. GDT did speak about the plans that he originally had for the sequel. And even though he didn't get into any huge detail, it sounds pretty damn compel balls. So what he did divulge was that it revolved around a villain, this tech entrepreneur who had invented his own version, like a new version of the internet, or how GDT puts it, the internet 2.0. Oh, and just an annoying side thought right here. Don't you love it how movie bad guys are whoever the world is afraid of at the time? For ages, movie bad guys were Nazis. Then in the 80s, it went to Russians. Then we had terrorists for donkey's ears. And now it's tech entrepreneurs. And then, you know, I wonder why. You know, it's not like they have access to our deepest, darkest desires on... Oh, oh, wait, no, they do. But I'm pretty sure that's going to change pretty soon because it's obviously going to be Russian dictators as bad guys for the next 40 years. No? Okay, okay, side thought over. Anyway, so the good guys realize that this villain got all of his technological knowledge from the precursors, whether that be from drifting with kaiju brains or otherwise, we don't know. But get this, they somehow discover that the precursors are not aliens at all, but humans in these kind of bio exosuits like the one in Independence Day, I guess. Humans from the future. So we've actually been fighting ourselves the whole time. 
damn, future us's are such assholes. And that would fit perfectly with the theory that not only is the human race becoming stupider over time, they're also becoming much bigger pricks to the point where they just go like, okay, what shall we do now? Let's go back to the past and cannibalize ourselves. Because the big question here is that if you go back to the past and kill all your ancestors, don't you inevitably kill your past and therefore yourselves? Or maybe their plan's not to kill everyone, just imprison everybody so that they can come back and terraform themselves a nice comfy planet to Netflix and chill on. Ah oh, shit, hold on, I've just deleted all my notes. Uh, undo, undo, undo. But I mean, another question would be, if they are humans, why would they be so set on terraforming Earth? My guess would be that they are so far ahead in the future that they have evolved to live in, was it a nitrogen atmosphere or a methane atmosphere? I can't remember. Everyone thinks you're stupid now. Shut up, Debbie. That's Debbie voice of my doubt. Anyway, that whole thing reminds me of a film called Pandorum, where if I'm remembering correctly, this guy wakes up from cryo sleep alone on the ship, only to realize that these horrible freaks that are hunting him that are actually humans, and that he's cryo slept for so long that they've evolved or devolved or whatever you call it. Anyway, I probably shouldn't be spoiling Pandorum for you. But this future human thing is intriguing, isn't it? Does it mean that they're not from an alternate dimension at all? I also find it intriguing that future humans, considering what we know now about warfare, would still choose to send giant monsters and not some sort of super nuke to kill all humans. So many questions that unfortunately we might never get to know the answers to. But wait, wait, no, one more question. Why wouldn't you send the kaiju back to a point in time before we had invented Jaegers? Because without Jaegers, we'd be fucked. They did though. We created Jaegers in response. Oh, here she is, the expert. What I mean is why didn't they send them back to a point in time like the Stone Age? And yeah, I'm on a cat. I guess this whole thing also means that this is Rally visiting the future, I guess, is it? I don't know. Making him, on top of everything, the world's first time traveler. Oh, Jesus Christ, adding time travel into this whole thing does make it a little complicated, don't you find? But all that aside, no matter the answer to all these questions, I probably would have loved this just because it would have had more focus on the universe's main villains, the precursors, an element of the story that we haven't really had much screen time devoted to, you know, considering they're the cornerstone of the whole thing. Like, don't get me wrong, like, I love seeing what their minions get up to, but it really feels like, you know, if it was a video game, you gradually beat all the kaiju bosses that get stronger, that gradually get stronger, then you have the side mission with the sisters of the kaiju and Breacher, but where's the final boss, you know, and what would he look like? Maybe he's just a giant super built version of this exosuit, maybe? That would be okay. That would, uh, I don't know, maybe not. You also wonder if, if GDT had stayed at the helm. It would have been much better. I don't know why I'm doing that voice. Whether Rally would have stayed in the franchise in this version of the script. And according to Charlie Hunnam, he probably would have. Whilst he was promoting Jungle Land. Anyone seen that one? I haven't. Whilst promoting Jungle Land. Hunnam was asked if he was ever meant to be in the sequel, to which he replied, certainly when Guillermo was talking about it, then yeah, definitely, I was a part of that conversation, and I think that his vision for it included me. But by the time they circled around and decided they were going to make it with a different director, we had a conversation about it, but I was booked up. There were business elements of it that required them to go into production very quickly. Legendary had just been acquired by Wonder out of China, and they wanted that film made very quickly, and I wasn't available. And it sounds very much to me like what often happens with these things is like they stagnate for so many years, and then somebody picks it off a shelf one day and goes like, we want this tomorrow, make it now, go, go, go. And then suddenly everyone's like, well, what the fuck? So it's very probable that Raleigh would have been in Pacific Rim Maelstrom. Interestingly enough, though, when Hunnam was asked about Pacific Rim the Black, he didn't have a clue. He, re he reacted as if he, and I quote, hadn't even known about it, which is kind of surprising, isn't it? Anyway, Raleigh being involved is a pretty big deal. Whether he would have piloted Gypsy Avenger or, or another Jaeger after the loss of Gypsy Danger is a whole other question. And personally, I find it really weird to think of him at the controls of Avenger. Like, I don't know why, but it just doesn't fit together somehow. Huh? Say something? But I would have loved to have seen any new Jaegers that would have been in here too, as GDT really nailed the physics of how a, of how a 100,000 ton robot could possibly move rather than, you know. But another character that would have stayed in a more central role rather than being killed off pretty early is Marco. According to GDT, she was the heart of the whole movie and a character that deserved more than just to be the character's reason for seeking revenge. It's said that Maelstrom would have seen her get to align her emotions, whatever that means, and get revenge on the kaiju. And then somehow 
die off screen. The details of her death aren't known, of course, but whatever it was, chances it would have been better than just sitting in a helicopter as it was hit by one of Obsidian's rockets. She at least deserved to go out in a Jaeger, in my view. Regardless, even if GDT had stayed on and Maelstrom had been amazing, there's no guarantee it would have led to a multi-movie franchise from there, but we can always torture ourselves with the faintest of possibilities that it might have eventually led to the Pacific Rim MonsterVerse crossover that would have had fans drooling. But no, you know, I won't go there. I won't do that to myself. Let's just hope that there is someone out there that cares enough for the franchise to not let it flatline completely. Personally, I'm hoping that there might be some announcement around the time of Pacific Rim's 10 year anniversary next year. And I don't mean just a fucking Blu-ray with extra bonus features. Oh my God, that's exactly what they're gonna do, isn't it? Fuck, now that I've said that. Anyway, let's leave it there for now. Let me know what you think Pacific Rim Maelstrom would have entailed and what you would have liked to have seen. Stay tuned to the channel as I want to be the first to bring you any news on the franchise if there is any. And of course, as well as the random usual assortment of stuff. Anyway, it's time for me to walk Charlie Beagle, take my meds and hit the sack. So let me invite you to get out of my head and I will see you very soon for the next one. Thank you very much for watching and cheerio bye.